So now if we look at basic lighting diffuse example 2.1, you can see it has diffuse lighting. There's the light coming from the white square, but then if I go around the orange cube, notice that the lighting is hitting the different sides because of different angles it's hitting them with different intensity. And in fact, even on each surface, it's a little subtle, I don't know if this shows up in the video, but because the angle from the point to the light is actually um, more perpendicular on the right side here, then on the left side of the surface, it's actually brighter towards the right edge, uh, particularly towards the top right, than it is to the rest of the surface. So be clear that this is computed on a per pixel basis, even in cases where the, the difference of angle is relatively subtle. So what this looks like in code is first off, our vertices now each have a normal vector attribute. For our purpose, we want the normals to be totally perpendicular with their respective surfaces. In cases where you want the lighting to smoothly transition from adjacent surfaces, then you actually want these normals to not be totally perpendicular with their surface. You want them sort of averaged with the other triangles this vertex has a component of. And that way when you compute the lighting, it'll give an appearance of a smoother transition over the edges, which is something we'll demonstrate later. But in this case, we don't want to depict any illusion of smoothness. We want this to just look like a hard edge cube. So again, all of these are just fully perpendicular to their surface. And now in the vertex shader, we're getting in not just a position, but a normal for each vertex. We're also getting the uniforms of model view and projection matrices, and we compute GL position as normal, but we're gonna also need the fragment position in world space. So we apply just the model transform onto A pause. And then to get the normal in world space, as I described, we take the model, we're gonna cut it down to a mat three to effectively eliminate the translation. There's a built-in transpose function and a built-in inverse function. And as I mentioned, we can flip the order of the inverse and the transpose. We could do the inverse first if we wanted, we would get the same result. So now in our fragment shader, we are gonna be computing an ambient component and a diffuse component, and these are gonna be combined into one and then multiplied with the object color. And that is our output fragment color. Now for simplicity, we're using the same light color uniform for both our ambient light and our diffuse light. In actual rendering, you generally want to configure these separately so they wouldn't necessarily be the same color value. But here for simplicity, we'll just have them be the same. And for the ambient, we simply just multiply it by this ambient strength to scale it down. So the light color actually is 111. So it's just a fully white light. So that's being scaled down to values of 0.1 for our ambient. And then for the diffuse, uh, again, we need two vectors. We need the normal vector and we need the light vector. And both of these need to be unit vectors, otherwise the dot product doesn't give us the correct result. Now, even if the vertex shader doesn't scale our normals so that they're still unit vectors, well, when we interpolate between unit vectors, the result is not necessarily a unit vector. So regardless, we're always gonna to want to normalize this to get norm. And then for the light vector, to get the vector from the fragment position to the light position, that's light pause minus frag pause. And again, we normalize. Now that we have norm and light direction, we get their dot product. That's what gets us our diffuse strength, except if the result is negative, we want it to be zero. And so that's what the max function is doing here. Max given two values returns whichever one is greater. So if the dot product is negative, we would get zero as the result, effectively putting a floor of zero on the value here. So now we have our diffuse strength and we multiply it by the light color and that gets us our diffuse component. So now that we have both of our light components, we simply add them together and multiply them on our base color and that gets us our result. As for specular light, again, the idea is that light on some surfaces tends to bounce off mostly at a reflected angle. And so if our camera is looking at the surface and in the path of this reflected angle, it's gonna get the full intensity of the specular component. And as the reflected light vector and the camera vector, as they diverge, the specular effect falls off. How quickly it falls off is something we're gonna govern with a constant. For some surfaces, you might want the specular highlight to appear as very large spots, so you want the fall off to be low, but for other surfaces, you want the specular highlights to be small, so you want a high fall off. You want the specular component to diminish quickly as the angle increases. So if we call the vector of light reflected off the surface and normalized, if we call that R, and call the vector from the point of the camera normalized, if we call that C, 
then very much like with the diffuse component, we want to get the dot product of these two vectors, clamping any negative values at zero. But because we generally want the fall off to zero to happen before the angle breaches 90, we're going to raise the value to the power of some constant k. So if your exponent is just, say, 8 or 16, you're going to get fairly large specular highlights. But if you increase it to 32, 64, 128, then you're going to get smaller, more focused highlights. Because remember, once we clamp the dot product, it's going to be between 0 and 1. You raise 1 to any exponent, it doesn't increase. 0 to any exponent doesn't increase. But for any value between 0 and 1, when you raise it to an exponent, you're making it smaller. And so the larger the exponent, the quicker those values are going to get smaller. And in the examples I gave, they're all powers of 2. They don't have to be powers of 2, but I believe the reason you might pick a power of 2 exponent is because then it could be computed cheaper. Because when you raise things to exponents of 2, uh, you can do so by bit shifting, and so it's a cheap operation. But in principle, any value of 1 or greater is valid for k. Now, because specular highlights are generally meant to be focused, we typically don't want there to be any specular component once the angle between the reflected vector and the camera is greater than, say, like 45 or, or 70 degrees on the, on the high end. But occasionally you do want to have uh, quite large specular highlights such that there should be a specular component for angles even greater than 90 degrees. But the algorithm, as we just explained, takes a dot product between these two vectors, and so when the angle exceeds 90 degrees, then the dot product's always going to be zero. So there's a simple variant of this algorithm called Blinfong, which starts with the observation that for the bisecting vector, the half vector between the light vector and the camera vector, well, when the specular effect is in full force because the camera vector coincides with the reflected angle, well, then this half vector, which we'll call h, should match the normal. And so instead of computing the reflected vector and finding its dot product with the camera vector, instead we're going to compute h and find its dot product with the normal. And so as h and n diverge, the specular effect falls off. The advantage here is that for any camera position, on this side of the surface, any camera position where the surface would be visible, h is never going to be greater than 90 degrees from n, and so the dot product is only zero in the case where the camera is on the plane of the surface or on the other side, where we can't see the surface anyway. And so if you want very large highlights by using low constants, a low value of k, you're not going to get an ugly cutoff artifact of the specular effect like we would with the regular algorithm. There are also some special cases where this is a little more efficient, but I don't think they apply when you have a perspective projection, so they would only work for an orthogonal view. I believe that's the case, I'm not sure. But the main reason to use Blinfong is simply that you get more correct results. Just keep in mind that for Blinfong, your k values are going to have to be larger to get the equivalent effect as with the regular algorithm. For example, if I use 32 for k for regular Fong and 32 for Blinfong, the Blinfong highlights are going to appear quite larger. This is because for the same change in camera angle here, the bisecting vector, h here, proportionally changes this angle to n at half the rate. And so for the same setup enlightened vector with Blinfong, you have a smaller angle, and so you then would have a larger dot product, and so to get the equivalent level of falloff, you would need a larger value for k. Now let's see specular lighting in action. Building on the previous example, we now have added in specular lighting. So as you can see, as I position my camera in the right spot, uh, you're seeing highlights on the, on the surface there. It's more sharp if I come over here. Yeah, you can see a fairly distinct highlight because my camera's positioned in the right spot to see it. So all that's different in the code now is in our fragment shader, well, first we have another uniform for the view position. And so we have to set that on the C++ side by sending it to the position of the camera. And like the light position, it should also be in world space. We need everything to be in terms of world space for these calculations. And so here we're doing the ambient and, and diffuse just as we did before, but now for the specular, we're having this constant specular strength, which just simply governs the intensity of the specularness. And as you can see here, we're using the same light color value for all three components, which that's just for simplicity. In real use cases, you might have different light colors for the different components, but in here, it's all just one. And last thing, we need to get this spec value, which is from the formula I showed you.
So view dir, that's the vector from the point on the surface to the camera. So it's view pause minus frag pause, and we normalize. And we're not doing blend fong here, we're just doing the regular specular algorithm. So we get the reflection direction of the light by calling the built-in function reflect, passing in the norm of the surface itself because that tells it what to reflect off of. And we actually want the negative of the vector because remember this is actually the vector from the point to the light. We want from the light to the point. And so by subtracting, that's what we get. And notice that we don't normalize here. Well, that's because the light direction already is normalized. So the reflection direction will be of unit length. We compute the dot product of both these vectors, get the max with zero, effectively capping the minimum value to zero. And then we're raising this to the exponent of 32. If we wanted smaller highlights, we would increase this constant. In fact, I will demonstrate this eh, even more, 128. And make sure that my updated fragment shader file is copied to the to build. I need to actually come here and just make an arbitrary change. So it'll actually rebuild the whole project. Okay, come over here and run it again. You will see that our specular highlights, they're smaller points. Notice they're not any brighter, they're not more intense, they're just more focused. If we want more intense highlights, we would up the specular strength here. So in fact, let me demonstrate that. I'll make it really bright, 1.5. Again, I have to trick the build system, rebuild, run it again, and we'll come and see that, yeah, that's definitely more intense. And in fact, we have this halo effect around it that almost looks like a lens flare, which is not realistic. I can't think of any situation where you'd want something that intense, but uh, there we go. Last example we'll look at in this video, 3.1 materials. Uh, what this is demonstrating is that uh, the material itself, the surface, its properties of how it gets rendered has been uh, parameterized. And also notice the color of our light is shifting over time. That's just to demonstrate the effects of different lights on these surfaces. And so looking at the code, uh, now for the fragment shader, this is the main thing that's changed. We've plugged in now for the light position, different values for ambient, diffuse, and specular, whereas before we just had the one light color. And for material, we now have properties of ambient, diffuse, and specular, and also shininess, which is plugged into uh, as the K component of our specular calculation. The larger this number, the smaller the highlights. The intensity of the specular component is more governed for the material by this specular value here, which is multiplied by spec. And so now we have a shader where for the different lights, you can have different colors for ambient diffuse and specular. And we can also for different materials, have them governed by different intensities of ambient diffuse and specularness. And notice these are VEC3s because these are RGB values. So it's really not just intensity, it's, it's more also color. Because the way we're representing light, we don't really distinguish between color and intensity. They're really one and the same thing here. They're just tied up together as an RGB value. Anyway, so notice now that we have some uniforms where these uh, struct values are expected. And this is interesting because we're defining structs on the GLSL side, but then how do you pass that in from the C++ side? Well, it's almost like these are really just namespaces almost, as far as we're concerned. So on the C++ side, you want to set the ambient of the light uniform, then it's light.ambient for the string value, and that's how you set it. So this is just like we were setting any other VEC3 uniform, except in this case, the uniform itself is actually a struct, and this is just one of its components, which is a VEC3.